Okay. Hey, let me put got it. Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Westport Library's Author Talk with Denisha Smith. We are so excited to have her join us to discuss her newest novel, The Prince, with Erica Melnicek. Ms. Smith is an Emmy Award winning filmmaker and novelist whose books include The Illusionist, Remember This, and The Honeymoon, among others. She writes short stories and was also a contributing editor at the New York Magazine and taught at Columbia University and the Bread Loaf Writers Conference. Erica Melnicek handled library marketing for Penguin Random House for many years and is now exploring new ways to support authors and the love of reading in Fairfield County. And I can't wait for the two of you to tell us more about The Prince. So without further ado, Erica and Denisha, tell us more. Thank you, Jennifer. It's so wonderful to be here with you, Denisha. Welcome and congratulations on the publication of your newest novel, The Prince. Um, with, and just a reminder to all of the, our viewers that it's on sale now and also already available on your library shelves. Uh, the Prince is a modern retelling of The Golden Bowl by Henry James and is the perfect book recommendation for those fans of Sally Rooney, Kate Atkinson, and even I've heard Danielle Steele referenced. Uh, the Prince presents us with entry into the privileged and moneyed world of New York's uh, city society through the Woodford family, for whom life seems perfect and idyllic. Um, but as we all know, what appears on the surface is usually only just that on the surface. Um, and there's tension in the air. Uh, we have Federico, a penniless Italian prince who is about to marry heiress Emily Woodford, the only child of the family's widowed patriarch Henry. And when Emily's beautiful enigmatic childhood friend, Christina appears on the scene as a guest at their wedding, that's when the trouble begins. Because as it turns out, Christina and the prince once had a passionate affair. And now Henry, Emily's father, is also enchanted by Christina. And now father and daughter uh, must face a new reality and learn more about who they can and cannot trust in their circle, in their family. Uh, Denisha, thank you for uh, joining us. Uh, maybe you could start out with uh, what drew you to Henry James's novel, um, The Golden Bowl, and um, how you used it as a model for this book. Well, I began, I read The Golden Bowl first in college and a couple of times mm -hmm. as an adult. What drew me was, this is a novel about secrets, about a wealthy family with a terrible secret. All families have some kind of secret, I think, or most. And this, in this case, in the James novel, as in The Prince, the question is how on earth is this family gonna solve the problems that emerge, that the secrets that become, become come to the surface. And so that was the main thing that drove me. It, it's, it, I think it's what's, what drives the prince, my novel, <clears throat> you, you see this family, you become aware of them in this terrible dilemma of a, um, uh, of a daughter's husband um, having an affair with her father's wife and what could be more difficult and terrible. And you begin to be aware of this and that pushes you along in the prince and in the golden bowl what are they going to do? How are they going to solve it? And they do solve it in a, I don't know how to describe, I don't want to give away the ending, but they do try, they have a solution and I have to leave it up to the reader to decide what kind of solution this is. Is it a good solution? Is it a terrible solution? Um, you'll see at the end. Well, and that seems to have, um, a Correct me if I'm wrong, but that stays true to the framework that Henry James had constructed yes. as well. Yeah. Yes. I stole the idea from James, some of the structure from James, and I brought it into the contemporary, to the modern world. I wrote it very differently from James. James is a difficult writer, though, a wonderful writer. My novel, The Prince, is written in what I would call ordinary English, which comes mm -hmm. 
I, I think from my background as a journalist, um, I was for 11 years at the New York Times writing about literature and ideas. And I, I began to learn, I thought, how to tell a story in, in ordinary English. Actually, my other novels are written that way. But this is, I was curious to unearth the secrets in James's novel and make them more apparent in The Prince. Um, I would even go so far as to say you you constructed more of a page turner, really, in the way that you modernized um, you know, your prose and the and the story. Um, I wouldn't necessarily describe Henry James as a page turner, um, though though <laughs> enjoyable to read as he is. But um, I did I I couldn't put um, the print down <laughs> once I had picked it up. Fun. I was hooked really early on. It was so enjoyable. Um, why do you think um, authors go back to classics? classics like this for some inspiration and what in particular was yours? I think that this is a trend right now. You perhaps mm. aware of Pat Barker's retelling of the story of the women in the Iliad, the voices mm. of the girls. Um, why? Because they're, well, Will Willa Cather, and I think it was Willa Cather said, there are only four stories in human life. Now, I think there are more, but there are the basic stories, yeah. the fall of the tyrant, um, forbidden love, um, you know, various basic stories. So the classics were the beginning of telling us these stories, perhaps those that even those which came out of the oral tradition. Um, in the case of the Iliad, for instance, it's young men going to war and what they did with the women in the war. In, in all conflicts, the roles, the role of women is, is often overlooked, but it is extremely important. So I think I was drawn to it as a basic story. Um, that would be the main reason um, he's telling a novel of which a secret is revealed. And that is the substance of a lot of, of, of classics. You know the the character <clears throat> the character doesn't know what's happening or what's going to happen, and then begins to learn what's happened. So I think it was that that drew me. Apart from the fact that I loved the Henry James novel and I wanted to spend time with it, and I reread it um, actually over the course of a year in order to write the Prince. Um, but I wanted to spend time with James. I'm not, not everyone wants to, but I did. <laughs> Uh, one detail I, I noticed and I wanted to ask you about um, that you uh, had briefly mentioned in this novel, uh, George Eliot, yes. uh, towards the end and her views. Yes. Um, uh, and and I, then I realized that your previous novel, The Honeymoon, yes. detailed Eliot's honeymoon um, yes. in Venice. Um, and yes. so could you talk about your inclusion of her within the, within the prints? Well, um, that's, that's very Good that you're so great to notice that. I, I did it as a private, little private joke because oh. actually one of the things that's extraordinary about Eliot is in my view, nobody can portray a bad marriage as well as George Eliot. So I have my character say this, um, she's innocent at this time. Emily, one of the main characters whose husband, the prince is having an affair with her mother-in-law, um, she is rather innocent, but I wanted to show the reader that she's smart, you know, that she was well-educated, even though she, she doesn't really know how to show her intelligence because in, in the world she comes from the extremely, of extreme wealth, women are not encouraged to show their intellectual, so I, their intellectuality. So I, I wanted Emily, to, I wanted to show her as being smart and educated and this was kind of a joke because in the novel she says no one like no one can portray a bad marriage as George Eliot. Well, it's an irony because she is in a very bad marriage and doesn't know it yet. And so it was a little private joke, a little tribute to my previous novel, the subject of my previous novel. Were there ways in which that you could um, explore the um, the themes of marriage and relationships that? That James wasn't able to uh, at the time that he was writing. Where did where were you able to um, 
to go that he wasn't? Well, this is an, actually a rather good question. In the James novel, there is the implication of sexual passion, but he goes, his idea of, of implying a consummation of this forbidden affair is to have them have a kiss. And I could go further as a contemporary writer. I didn't, I personally, as a novelist, don't think that explicit sex scenes, re, which are put in the novel to move the plot along, I don't think that works um, because sex is a universal um, human uh, activity. But I was able to delineate or to describe the passion that these people feel, this passion that's so terrible between the prince and his, basically his, his mother-in-law, their passion, I was able to describe it, whereas James is very subtle about it, has a lot of power, but he couldn't at that period really bring it to the surface. And I was able to do that. So I describe the intensity of their feelings for each other. I do have them go away for a forbidden weekend to mm -hmm. an inn and I say they make love, but I don't describe it in great detail, but Jim, James could never have done that. Never, never, never in that, in that novel. All he could do in The Golden Bull was imply it. In my case, in The Prince, I could say it. That, uh, that reminds me of a, an English professor of mine once who proclaimed, there is never any kissing in Jane Austen. That's right. <laughs> so in all of the are. revisits and, and uh, in, you know, novels or movies yes. inspired by, there is never any <laughs> moment true. of a, even a chaste kiss in, in Jane Austen and nor did there need to be uh, for it's what true. she- true, isn't that thinking. true? I hadn't yeah. thought of that, of course. <laughs> and there just couldn't be. Um, these novels would not be read or bought, although there was a thriving, you know, industry and pornography in Great Britain during that time, but it was largely withheld from women and women authors, but it was just, you couldn't have done it. Henry James wouldn't have done it. He actually was probably, not only was he operating under the conventions of his time, the novel was published in 1904, but he reaped the rewards of that, of that a method in other words, implying passion is a very powerful literary tool. Whereas, well, I think I do that too, but I'm a, I go a little further. You know, I, I let you know that they made love on that rainy day. In James's, in Henry James, there is a rainy day. She comes and they kiss in my novel. I allow, I allow him to touch her in the prince. He touches her waist. Um, but you know, I feel that you certainly are, it's more explicit um, in, the, in the, so that was one way I brought it into the modern world. Um, <clears throat> other ways that were interesting, at least to me, I was interested in the notion, the issue of inherited wealth. <clears throat> in Henry James, the, one of the characters is a, a basically a Robert Baron. In my novel, The Prince, these wealthy people are descended from a Robert Baron. The robber barons were rather were, were brutal people. They weren't educated people. But what happens to their descendants who inherit this wealth, who know that their antecedents were, were not good men, that they exploited their workers terribly, cruelly, people like Andrew Carnegie, a John, um, a John Rockefeller. So I wanted to see what would that be like? So my character in The Prince, the father who is the patriarch Henry, he knows, he's ashamed of the origins of his wealth. He lives in this immense wealth, but he is ashamed and he actually becomes a public interest lawyer. Now, you know that the Rockefeller family of the, this modern generation, some of them are doctors, a lot of them are environmentalists. They, they try to do good. Of course, they know who John D. Rockefeller was. So I was interested in, in what happens to these people. We're, we're giving, we're, we have a new generation of billionaires, but they, 
we don't know what their descendants are going to feel about the Facebook scandals or, or Bezos's refusal to let his workers unionize or whatever comes up. But I was interested in, in what happens. And also, now that these descendants are cushioned by this immense wealth, what effect does that have on them? My heroine in the Prince, Emily, the wealth is in the air she breathes. And in some ways, she is very innocent at the beginning of the novel. She's sheltered. She's very sweet. But then in The Prince, she has to become aware of evil, of things that she had never had to become aware of. She had to come out of this cocoon that she's in, which is part of, you know, what, part of what drives the novel, as I said. That would be another way. And it was fun to um, bring it into the contemporary world. The, the family in my, my novel, The Prince, owns a private island in Long Island Sound. And at this point, this is what we would call Gardner's Island. My family has nothing to do with the family that owns Gardner's Island. But I was fascinated that in this day and age, there could be these spaces such as this island that nobody can go onto, that are primeval places nobody can go there unless they're members of this family. So that interested me. You know, what does that mean in the modern world? So those are some of the things I brought, I thought, into the 20th century or 21st century. Um, another relationship that had interested me um, that also felt very central to, um, to the narrative was between Henry and Emily, the father-daughter, yes. uh, very codependent relationship. Um, how, what did you explore with that um, ex exactly um, uh, and well, how, it, how it followed the characters through the turmoil that was to come? Well, it's interesting because once in a while in a critical essay on the Golden Bolt, you'll read that he was implying it was incestuous. I don't think that for a minute. Mm -hmm. I think it was extremely close in fact, James, Henry James based his novel on someone he knew, a father and daughter who were very, very close. Then he, the father, who's wealthy, um, went, encourages the marriage and then builds a studio for the groom, he's an artist, and has, has them come and live with him. So, okay, what this closeness, it comes about in the prince from the death of Emily's mother and Henry's wife, which shattered them, obviously. Uh, in Henry's case, the wife had helped him deal with his, his past, with this fortune. She encouraged him to become a lawyer, to help people. He was a pro bono lawyer. She had, he was very depressed because um, as a young man, his own mother had committed suicide. So his wife's death just broke apart his world. And in Emily's case, she was a child and the death of a mother is that is, uh, is terrible, of course, for a child. So the two of them are thrown together. They're intensely close. Emily looks like his late wife. She is, remember, very sheltered. She wants to protect her father who doesn't really need protecting, but she's afraid something bad could happen to him. So she's emotionally drawn to him. Well, um, it's very relatable yes. um, for, for many of us feeling yeah. that's part of becoming an adult as you begin to feel responsible for your parents, for Absolutely. their happiness, for their longevity, for- Absolutely. For and in my novel, um, she, Emily, when she's in college, moves back home. I mean, she's in the same city. I thought of her as maybe going to Barnard. She, she moves back in with her father. She's terrified that um, something could happen to him, that he could be hurt more than, he, even more than he was by her mother's death. Um, and again, this extreme wealth sort of, in a way, imprisons them. They have fewer outlets for emotional gratification or for forming other relationships that would 
sustain them. So that, that I was conscious of, yes. It's an interesting idea that wealth can be as restricting or constricting as the lack of it, um, depending yes. on your on your experience of it. Yes. I mean, we know that wealthy people travel in limousines, therefore they don't have the interaction with others that you get on the street or a cab driver. They 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 live in very secure homes, and at least in that city, in, in this city. Um so their interactions with others than their own sort of people are limited. And uh, that is a kind of cocoon, an imprisonment. I mean, a very nice one perhaps to be that wealthy, but yes. Um, uh, would you have any, so I would imagine this, um, this novel, The Prince is going to be very popular with book clubs. And would you have any, um, recommendations for some initial conversation starters for a book club. Uh, what would you imagine um, that, you know, a group of people coming together, having all read your novel, what, what would you imagine they'd want to talk about? Uh, perhaps? Well, I would first discuss, um, try to actually discuss why she, she, me, would take <laughs> the Henry James novel and make it into the prints. Now, some book club members will not have read Henry James. He's not very fashionable right now. Um, so that would be one question. Um, I would, if assuming that people in the book club had read the book, which I, oh, before they met, um, let's assume that, they would have known about the book. So what would they think of the resolution to this terrible secret in The Prince? What do they think of, of the decision at the end? Um, what are the elements? Um, what, is, what does the reader think of this family in their cocoon? Um, do they feel, excuse me, do they feel sorry for them? Do they um, feel pity or do they, you know, feel, okay, come on, you're very, very rich, you have these problems. You know, I, so what? Um, what do they think of Emily, the innocent center of this? Um, is she is she stupid? It, why is she not aware in the beginning? Then there's this other character, Christina, who is interesting to me. She's the one, the gorgeous woman, woman who is having the affair with with Emily's husband and the prince. Is Christina bad? because she loves the prince and they're having this affair while she's married to this older man. Um, is she bad? What drives her? Why does she, is it? In other words, she loves mm. the prince, that drives her, but who is she in her background? Is she just a temptress, just a sexual person? Um, is she, does she have character? Does she come from you know, a real world? Um, I would be interested to know what people thought of her. You know, she, I, found her I found her to be very sympathetic. Yes. Um, as a character, but definitely ma not making the right, right choices <laughs> from, from very early on, but, uh, but also very relatable. Um, you know, when a relationship ends and it ends not to your liking and not of your decision and you can't let go, she just can't let right. him go. Um, and you know, a lot of us could see, you know, could see that. I mean, that's that's very from our, modern. From our youth, we could see that. From our youth, right? Yes. Exactly. When we were, before we met our life partners, um, yes, she. I. <clears throat> this is something I try to do in the novel, um, in the Prince, in in James. She's just this beautiful, charismatic character. I wanted to give her a background. Um, I wanted to explain who she is. So I decided, I created a world for her. I decided she, her mother is an American living in Rome. A lot of the novel takes place, not a lot, but quite a bit of the novel takes place in Rome. So I envisioned her as in some way a neglected child. Her mother's kind of a hippie, goes from you know cult to cult. Her mother loves her, but she, Christina, and the prince has to learn to be independent. So as a child, she's making her own breakfast and 
guys who spent the night with her mother are coming into the kitchen to get coffee. But this makes her, she has no money, which is, there was some family money, but now there is none. And that's why she and the prince couldn't marry because he's impoverished. But I wanted to portray her as independent as she is, she is tortured by what she's doing. She can't help it. Um, passion is very interesting to write about in a novel, you know, and you don't want to make your character a bad person. First of all, the reader would have trouble following the book. But apart from all else, I don't even think that such people are bad. I think she's in the grip of a passion that she can't control in the prince. That's it. She just loves this man. He had loved her not only because she's beautiful, but because she was strong and he was searching for who he was. He was a bit of a lost soul, which we can talk about later. But that was a calculated decision. Give these people a complex, the complexity of all humans. We are all a mixture. And I tried very hard to do that. And James doesn't do that, which doesn't mean that in The Golden Bull, she isn't a rather dazzling character. But I think by giving her this life that I maybe made her predicament more vivid. Uh, yes, let's talk about the prince yes. um, for a moment uh, as a character and um, the, the history around um, uh, royals, uh, um, you know, in Europe and, and the, the American sensibility to that, because we very much, even now in modern times, have this fascination with the, with the current ro royals, with their history, yeah. uh, with their love affairs. Uh, right. Well, <laughs> um, interestingly enough. Evergreen. <laughs> right. In Great Britain, where I actually grew up, royalty is still in place. In Italy, First of all, titles are not recognized by the Italian government, which is a sort of port. Uh, they're still battling the House of Savoy are in, in Italy, for instance, are battling for some, you know, position. However, there's a, that's a crucial difference. I actually found um, an Italian prince who was running a food truck in Los Angeles selling pizza. I, I mean, I, I don't know if he's still doing it, but I, I sort of thought it was, you know, told me the story. There are several things that happen in Italian royalty. One, the taxes on the princely estates are extremely high. Then there is a kind of landmark status for these um, palazzos, these estates. You're not allowed to break them up into apartments in, in most cases. So what's happened to, a, and as money, goes down through the generations, it can often dissipate if it's not well invested. So you have a lot of, in, in many cases, the royals rent out rooms to tourists or they rent the whole place to tourists for huge amounts of money to even keep these places going to pay for the necessary repairs and so on. So now, the prince in Italy, if he went to private school, would be amongst wealthy students. But to them, it, the, the title would not have the same resonance. When a, when a member of royalty comes to the United States, we are fascinated by this. Um, we don't have titles in our, in our country. So there's a lot of resonance. So here's a guy who really doesn't have any money who comes and yet his title helps him. It gets him a job in this Italian bank so that his boss can introduce him. Uh, please meet my friend, the prince. He's going to guide you on your investments. Of course, the prince knows nothing about the stock market, which is one of the paradoxes of the, of the, um, the prince, the novel. And um, he also, as I said, he's kind of a lost soul he doesn't really have an identity other than a member being a member of this old family and he, you see him trying to have a rock man you know that's the kind of thing a lot of people of his age might try to do it's a failure um his mother said oh you're so talented but he said you know he knows he isn't 
And then he also, in his own way, tries to find meaning. Uh, he coaches an, a soccer team made up of migrant, migrant children. Now, the migrants in Rome uh, are, they come across on the Mediterranean, they go to the cities, they live in abandoned buildings, they live on the streets, some of them are kids, teenagers, and the Romans hate them, they hate them. And the police come and they tear down their shelters, they, in these abandoned buildings, they destroy the toilets, and these kids are left to make a, a living whichever way they can, maybe stealing, maybe doing, you know, heavy work, whatever the case, um, a lot of the migrants are, you know, teenagers. Um, so he tries to find meaning and moral value in his life by coaching these kids. And um, so he's trying to become himself, you know, become a, an adult with, with a worthy life in the prince. And, um, and then he struggles a lot. I was really interested in his struggle within his marriage mm -hmm. and his relationship to Emily's money. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I believe it, it is at the very first chapter where it's the prenuptial agreement, yes. um, which, um, you know, it can, can be fraught. It's emotionally fraught, but it's a very legal process at, at the very beginning of a new marriage. Um, what a way to start the book, actually. <laughs> well, you know, this is, thank you for noticing that, because in the early part of the Golden Bull, an allusion is made to a contract. Um, in my novel, I decided to make that a big scene. So that was kind of, uh, I should add that in The Prince, some of it was quite fun, not all. Writing a novel is very, very difficult. But mm -hmm. sometimes it was fun when you build a world, when you build a scene. So I researched uh, contemporary marriage agreements, marriage contracts, and they certainly exist, especially in wealthy families. And I also thought about who would be present in this. Um, where would the office be? A lot of the great old law firms in New York have moved into these huge skyscrapers, which is kind of counterintuitive. You would think they'd live in one of these old buildings, but the notion of this big, powerful building. Um, and then I thought, okay, so how would he feel as he signed this? And I enjoyed trying to think that through. What would happen right after the signing? Well, they'd go and have a drink. I mean, the prince only has coffee, but <laughs> Henry, the father, has to have a whiskey because he's giving his daughter away. So that was something I enjoyed doing. Um, and there were other things that I enjoyed, um, but you can ask me about them. <laughs> um, well, I'm going to um, ask one, maybe perhaps one last question. Um, I, I always love to ask um, authors in particular, any reader, but especially authors, um, what are you reading now or what have you read recently um, that is you're enjoying or is bringing you inspiration and are you are you looking for any inspiration for your next um, for your next project, or do you already have it? Well, first of all, what I'm reading, um, I like to talk about it. Um, I've discovered it, there is a novel called Sh Shuggy Bane. I don't know if you know of it. It's a novel about the north of England in the post-industrial period about poor people, and by this author Stuart. I it's one of the great novels of our time. I cannot recommend it highly enough. It's in a, com a completely different novel from my own, The Prince. Shuggy Bane is the name. Then I became interested in, in the early novels of Pat Barker, who wrote the Regeneration series. That's her most famous about um, the toll taken on veterans of World War I, uh, shell shock. But she wrote a number of early books, early novels about the same group of people. That is British working class people who were, you know, whose lives were destroyed by deindustrialization and by uh, Margaret Thatcher's policies. Mm -hmm. um, so this couldn't be more different from The Prince. Um, and I, the other thing is, what is my, what am I planning next? 
Well, I'm very involved in the post-publication of the prints. Um, I, I wish I had a plan for something. I do find ideas running around in my mind. Um, I haven't set out to explore them on paper, um, but you know, you finish a novel and you're kind of wiped out. There are people who, such as the late Edgar Doctor, who's a friend of mine actually, who really never stopped the minute Wow, the publisher, he would start up again. And I cannot tell you how much I admired him both as a writer, as a man. Um, but I'm afraid I don't yet have a, a, a solid idea after the prince. No, not yet. I have several ideas, but don't well, know. That's where, that's where opportunity can enter. Yes, <laughs> yes indeed. Oh, well, I want to thank you, Denisha, for joining thank us you. today and speaking with me. This was a delight. Thank you. Um, I found the Prince to be such a compelling and enriching homage to Henry James, um, but also just enjoyed it in its own right as well. Thank um, you. It's um, been far too long since I've read a novel of his, and you've definitely inspired me to um, embark on a, on a journey of revisiting some classics. So I appreciate that I, about I this experience. Like I like to tell a good story. That's my goal. Oh, and you certainly did that with the prints. Thank you so much. Okay, I'll see you later. Goodbye. And, and I thank you both, Erica and Denisha, on behalf of the Westport Library for bringing the prints to us. Um, I can't wait to read it. Mm -hmm. And so if you're watching, either buy the book or borrow it from the Westport Library. Yes. There it is, the prints. Um, thank you both. Me. Okay, take good care. Good luck to all Thank of you. Thank you so much. Okay, bye-bye.